Good morning. Great to be together today. And here we are just a couple of days from um, 2024. And the years do fly by. And uh, I was thinking the other day of when my wife and I first came to this valley, I came by myself and um, I took a Greyhound bus from Northern California, where my wife and I, we just finished driving to California from Indiana. I left my car with her. I just jumped a bus and drove it down here. 12 hour drive took considerably longer than that on a bus. My brother loaned me his, uh, his car and he lived in Vista right near Oceanside. And, um, I, I don't know how long I, I was took, I don't know, a day, two days, whatever. I'm not sure, but I drove over to the 15 freeway and headed up through, um, Escondido and, um, over to Fallbrook and then down in Temecula. Temecula at the time in 1982 had about 10,000 people, as I remember, small, uh, small community. And, um, Murrieta had a thousand, Wildemar had about a thousand, Elsinore had about 10,000. And so those four towns together had 22,000 people. But uh, coming over the mountain into that valley, you know, there's just nothing in this whole valley. A lot of, a lot of agriculture. There were horse tracks, um, several horse race tracks, training horse tracks in Murrieta. They're all covered up with houses now. But, but uh, one of the men I met early on in the church, he, he worked with the thoroughbreds, the race horses. And we had, um, it was just not much here at all. But God so richly blessed. And, um, and God did some wonderful things, miracle things. Uh, I worked, I worked hard. I spent a lot of time knocking on doors, spent time working physically, trying to make some money to feed us. But, but God was so good. So anyway, I came up by myself, spent a day or two. I can't remember how long, went back to my brother's, returned the car, and then uh, took a Greyhound back up north, got my wife, and we drove into town. And, and that was 42 years, 41 years ago about July of 1982, I guess. And um, God's been good is all I can say. The place has grown. It's a city now. And um, a little more city, <clears throat> a, little, a little nicer than I would prefer, but whatever God wants, it's his call. I wanted to mention a couple things. I was listening to a sermon um, this week from last Sunday. Um, I think it was last Sunday. I think it was Christmas Eve. Yeah, it, was, it would have been last Sunday, of Alan Domlin. He talked about goal setting, and I just wanted to throw this out before. I, I'm going to be in Proverbs chapter 20 in a minute. But at the end of the year, beginning of the, beginning of the new year, um, and you could listen to this sermon. He did a great job, and, and I enjoy preaching. I enjoy his preaching. He pushes. He, he's driven. He, he has a goal of let's, let's do something. Let's don't sit in mediocrity. Let's don't sit in complacency. Let's go and make something happen. And, and as I get older, I need that even more. But I think all of us need it. But here's some things he said about goal setting, set unselfish goals. And again, this, was, this would have been uh, December 24, 2023. And you can get the right sermon. This is about his outline. Set unselfish goals. Uh, plan some things for others. Build your 2024 goals around others. That's a biblical way to live. Secondly, he said, um, have realistic goals, goals you can attain. If you've never read your Bible, don't say, I'm going to read my Bible through four times this year. That might be unrealistic. Um, realistic goals. If you, if you need to lose some weight, don't say, I'm going to lose 150 pounds this, this year. Try a pound a week or a pound a month or 10 pounds or 20, whatever. But make them realistic. Third, he said, have spiritual goals. Have goals about Bible reading and prayer and church attendance and, and witnessing and soul winning and teaching a class or serving in your church. Have some spiritual goals. So number one, unselfish goals. Number two, realistic goals. Number three, spiritual goals. Number four, some goals about victory. God is a God of victory. Uh, get some, uh, find that thing that you need to get victory over and, and by God's grace, win it. Make it your goal. Might be your anger. Might be some mental, maybe some things that you think on that you shouldn't. Self-pity, greed, covetousness, whatever it might be like that. Um, maybe some moral things. You're going to step up your, your, uh, your, your sanctification, your setting aside from the things of the world, whatever it might be. Set some, uh, set some goals of victory. God is, thank be, thanks be to God that giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ, Paul wrote. And so there is 
victory in Jesus Christ. Uh, beat liquor, beat tobacco, um, beat the television, whatever it might be. Uh, beat that video game that occupies you so much. And so unselfish goals, realistic goals, spiritual goals, victorious goals, and then goals that demand faith. Why not set a goal in, in that God would do something beyond you that you couldn't do in your own strength? Uh, as a church, um, I, one of our big goals, by faith goals, I want to get our building up. Um, we are at uh, December, Thanksgiving to December, recent weeks, Thanksgiving, Christmas, New Year's, our building's full. And, um, and we need that new building. And uh, last Sunday, we, there was a question, um, Brother Josh, uh, my assistant pastor, our youth director, he's, um, we're standing on the platform looking um, during what congregational scene or whatever, trying to decide, can we have the teen, because the adult choir sings, and then they sit down, then the teen choir comes up, and then we're trying to decide if there's enough room for the teenagers to go get a seat or if we should keep them in the choir loft. And um, we need a new building. Well, that's one of my big goals. That's going to take some faith. And I need a whole bunch of you to have some faith. Um, let's pray that God would allow us to get this building up. And, and it'll double the size of our auditorium. And we need that. It'll also give us a gymnasium. And um, our boys have got the winningest team. I mean, our, our God has blessed our youth program all these years. Uh, unbelievably blessed our youth. Of course, the, the um, uh, anyway, just great seeing what God has done with our young people. But uh, then they've, athletically, they've excelled. And we play on pavement and practice and dirt and cracks and cracks pavement. And, and I put those boys and girl, girls in the gym. They won't know how to act. But, um, but some goals that take faith, um, faith to accomplish, faith to, ch to achieve, um, some things that'll step out. But anyway, if you want the, the whole sermon, you can listen to it online. His, his messages are on, on YouTube. You search for Alan Domley, um, Maranatha Baptist Church. You'll find a lot of his sermons. He has some short five, seven minute things. Uh, he does um, like my morning moments like this, but then his Sunday sermons are on. And then it's a great church. By the way, we'll be, a group of us will be going to, to Bethany, Oklahoma, right outside Oklahoma City. We'll go in March. And uh, he has me preach. I don't know why, but um, uh, this year, Brother Domley, Brother Bob Gray, uh, Brother um, Jack Treber from North Valley Baptist of Santa Clara, and myself, the four of us will be speaking, plus um, some others as well. Um, some uh, just some great, uh, great people. It'll be a great conference, and and um, I'm hoping to bring some of our young people along. And we do it during our school spring break, so our staff can go if they'd like to. And it's just a good place to get a kick in the pants and say, let's get out and do something for God and, um, and let's, let's accomplish something. But anyway, um, uh, set some goals for this year. What would you like to do and what would you like to accomplish? And uh, maybe you want to potty train that child, <laughs> whatever, I don't know. Um, but, but, but set some goals and uh, maybe I'm, you're going to be faithful to soul winning each week. Maybe you're going to carry a track and pass out a track every week. You're going to pass out one track. Um, to some lost person. That'd be great. Anyway, Proverbs chapter 20. I want to mention something. I have um, a, uh, a um, passionate distaste for liquor. I think booze is bad. Um, I th I'm against the drunks. And I'm not against the drunk. I'm against the drunk drinking. I'm against social drinking. I'm against a casual beer after work. I'm against a martini or whatever kind of drink. Um, hanging out with the guys or the gals um, at some bar after you get off work. I'm against all of it. I'm against a beer with your hot dog at the ball game. I'm against it. I'm against an ice chest with sparkling booze, you know, whatever. Uh, at your camping trip, I'm against liquor. I'm against liquor. In fact, let me, let me read something um, real quick here. This is um, in regards to J. Frank Norris. Um, Norris was uh, at pastor of the biggest church in in uh, Michigan and the biggest church in um, Texas and um, actually the two biggest churches in America. He pastored both of them. An amazing man and a brilliant man. Of course, he had Louis Ensminger with him, who was an amazing organizer of Sunday school, and he had some great help. But he grew up. His story as a boy, he was beaten by a drunkard dad. He suffered much physically. His family, of course, suffered, 
And when he started pastoring, there was a problem that um, there was a group of people, of board members of, of, that were leaders in his church that were pro-liquor. And it brings him into this. There's a problem. There was a committee pushing liquor in the community. And there were men in leadership in his church who were members of that committee. He had a decision to make. Uh, what um, conflict I had. One voice in me says, you're the pastor of a great city church. Don't stir up a row over this liquor question. These men are men of wealth and prestige, bankers and capitalists, and you'll make your make a fool of yourself to say anything about it. Besides, you can't do anything about it. Another voice in me said, you, the pastor of a great church, will you permit officials and deacons to remain on your official board who are personally responsible for the world uh, to, before the world for this liquor convention? Have you forgotten the rivers of tears that liquor caused in your own sainted mother? Have you forgotten how it wrapped its slimy coil around the best uh, and one of the most brilliant men who ever drew a breath of life and wrecked him? Have you forgotten that liquor knows no race, no color, no wealth, no poverty? I was brought up when a small boy in the writings of Henry W. Grady, and I recall how he said, my friends, don't trust it. It's powerful. It's aggressive and universal in its attacks. Tonight, it enters a humble home to strike the roses from a woman's cheek. Tomorrow, it challenges this republic in the halls of Congress. Today, it strikes the crust from the lips of a starving child. And tomorrow, levies the tribute from the government itself. There's no cottage humble enough to escape it. There's no palace strong enough to shut it out. It is the mortal enemy of peace and order, the despoiler of men, the terror of women, the cloud that shadows the face of children, the demon that has dug more graves and sent more souls to judgment than all the pestilence of the wasted life since God sent plagues on Egypt and all the wars since Joshua stood before Jericho. It can profit no man by its return. Of course, it's prohibition days. And it's pro it shall profit mainly by the ruin of your sons and mine. It comes to mislead human souls and crush human hearts under its rumbling wheels. It comes to the gray-haired mothers. Uh, it comes to bring the gray-haired mothers down in sorrow to their grave. It comes to the the wife's love to bring the life's love to despair and her pride into shame. It comes to still the laughter of the lips of little children and to stifle all the music of the home and fill it with the silence of desolation and on and on. Well, he made his decision and uh, he called a meeting of the deacons and the leadership of the church. I called him over to a little corner of the building and that meeting he held a paper in his hand with the names with their names on the liquor committee. He said, I shall never forget my experience and my feelings. I'd come to the do or dare decision. It was life and death. God was good to the young man that morning. And I knew then for the first time something of what Daniel must have felt when he stood before Belshazzar, Belshazzar, Belshazzar and read, that read the handwriting on the wall or what Peter felt when he stood and said, we ought to obey God rather than men. Um, and he took his stand. And oh, he made waves. He made waves in Texas, especially. And uh, what a great thing. Now, let's look at Proverbs chapter 20. Wine is a mocker. Period. There's a comma there, but it doesn't make, we don't have to go any further. Wine is a mocker. Wine makes fun of people. Booze. Oh, well, you just need a glass or two before bed to make you sleep better. Well, take a Tylenol PM or a shot of, of uh, NyQuil or something. Don't, don't promote the liquor industry that destroys so many lives. Wine is a mocker, verse 1 says. Strong drink is raging. Whosoever is deceived thereby is not wise. If you think booze is okay, this statement says you're not very wise. And the opposite of wisdom is foolishness. And we ought to be against it in every way. And you go over just a couple of pages. Uh, Proverbs chapter 21 Um he that loveth pleasure shall be a poor man, and he that loveth wine and oil shall not be rich. Booze robs us of our financial stability, takes away the money from the children that need it for school and for our things. It takes away the, the home, the nice things of a home. It takes away the morals of a, of a young man, and, and it, it uh, erodes the, the uh, resistance and the restraint that loving parents have put into people, and it just makes a person very palatable in the hands of Satan. Booze is a, is a horrible, tragic thing. Um, Proverbs chapter 23, verse 29, who hath woe 
who hath sorrow, who hath contentions, who hath babblings, who hath wounds without cause, who hath redness of eyes. Here's who, they that tarry long at the wine, they that go to seek mixed wine. And, the, and their statement, look not upon the wine when it is red, when it giveth its color in the cup, when it moveth itself aright. Stop even looking at it. Don't get around it. Don't watch those liquor ads on the tube or on the billboard. Don't get looking at, at these, those good-looking models, those, those uh, beautiful women and good-looking men sipping their drinks and, and uh, promoting booze. Booze is such a vile and corrupt thing. Um, when the Bible says hell hath enlarged itself, I'm sure liquor had something to do with that. And I hate the liquor's pulled people out of church and liquor has broken up marriages and liquor has killed an endless stream of people in the freeways and caused countless uh, um, tragic accidents and shed much innocent blood because of liquor over and over and over. I'm against liquor. You ought to be against liquor. He goes on. Um, Proverbs 23, verse 32, at the last it biteth like a serpent and stingeth like an adder. Not the first time. Um, the devil will get the young man or the young girl drinking a little bit and, and loosen up their restraint, and loosen up their discretion, and it'll, it'll slowly erode their morality. It'll slowly open their mind up to a, a more relaxed and a, a, a more easygoing manner. And pretty soon they're saying things they wouldn't say and doing things they wouldn't do all because of liquor. See, at the last, the devil doesn't care if you drink casually for weeks or months or years, but at the last it biteth like a serpent and it stingeth like a, an adder. Thine eyes shall behold strange women and thine heart shall utter perverse things. Thou shalt be as he that lieth down in the midst of the sea or as he that lieth in the top of a mast. They have stricken me. Shalt thou say, I was not sick. They have beaten me, and I felt it not. When shall I awake? I will seek it yet again. Liquor, verse after verse after verse, from verse 29 down to verse 35, six verses in a row, all on booze. Proverbs usually usually a thought and a thought, and they're independent thoughts. This is six verses straight, one after another after another. Liquor is bad. Liquor is horrible. Liquor will destroy you. Liquor will kill you. We need to get a little bit of an anger at vile things that destroy lives. We need to, the thing that robs teenagers of their discretion and their propriety, the thing that opens young people up to the carefree, reckless life that turns them into uh, morally depraved people, we ought to be against it. We ought to be against the booze that wrecks marriages and causes wives to be beaten and children to be beaten. We ought to be against the liquor that causes endless car, uh, countless car wrecks, an endless stream of, of blood pouring out of the car wrecks because of liquor. We ought to be against all of it. And some will say, well, we just drink with restraint. Well, then you're an advertisement to the person who won't drink with strength with restraint. So you drink with restraint and the devil says, see, you can drink. It won't hurt you. You'll be like Mr. And Ms. So-and-so. They just have a casual drink now and then you can be like them. Only they don't have the character you do and the, and the restraint you do. And so they're going to start drinking like you are and they're going to kill somebody on the road or they're going to, that guy's going to beat his wife or that lady's going to abuse her children. And all because you advertised the devil's drink. You were the proponent of it. You're the one who said, it's okay to drink. Your kids saw you drinking casually, and so they drank casually. Only one or two of your children, they're going to drink excessively and destroy their lives. Your grandbabies will have a, a divorce in their home, or they'll have an abusive home because you as grandpa and grandma, you advertised liquor as if it was okay. You know good and well liquor is a vile drink in, invented in hell and bottled by satanic money-hungry people with a goal of destroying the families and the lives of our country. And we need to, Christians, I am unashamed of saying to a Christian, you need to get right with God and get a, a, a hatred for liquor. 
Uh, I'm against it's New Year's Eve. Uh, it's just a couple of nights away. Be sober. I don't mean just be sober. I mean, don't take a drink. The most liquor I've had in these 40 plus years I've been here is NyQuil. And it's a lot of liquor, but I mean, it's a lot of alcoholic content. But no one gets drunk drinking NyQuil. No one goes out and buys a case of NyQuil and sits around sipping on it all during the football game. No, that's Coors and Michelob and Bud Dumber and all that kind of stuff. We need to get a, a, an internal, passionate hatred for the thing that destroys lives. Now, I may be able to drink some, but you know what? We're not at the last yet, and I don't know where it's going to lead me. I don't, but but maybe I could say, you know, I just drink a beer now and then, and, and I don't drink much. Well, right now I don't. See, at the last, it biteth like a serpent and stingeth like an adder, but it might not be at my last. It might just be God lets me go through life. Being Look, even the preacher drinks liquor. He sits around Sunday afternoon with the guys drinking his wine coolers and his bubbly this or his champagne that on New Year's Eve. Oh yeah, preacher, you go ahead and you be an advertisement for the most filthy, vile thing Satan has ever poured into the mouth of a, of a child of God. And you go ahead and advertise it like it's okay. And, and you wait till eternity when you see the people whose lives were wrecked and you were the advertisement. You let down the bars of restraint on liquor. And you're the, you go online right now and, and type, what does the Bible say about Christians drinking liquor? You'll find hundreds of preachers, false preachers, I'll call them, who will endorse liquor and say, well, it's not wrong. The Bible says don't be drunk. It's, it doesn't say don't drink. Well, right here it says don't even look at it. So unless you're blind while you're drinking, you're violating the command of God. You know good and well that bottle has destroyed more lives. And, and liquor becomes such a social thing. Everybody sits around drinking some. And I, I don't know, maybe most people who drink liquor never slap a child, never beat a wife, never get in a car accident. They Maybe they never drive drunk. I don't know. But I know a whole bunch of them who do. And I know that there's countless lives who have soiled their morality because their restraint was dislodged through a bottle of booze. And you want to advertise that stuff? You want to say that stuff's okay? Shame on you, preacher, who'd stand up and, and endorse the devil's drink. Shame on you, and you'll face God for what you've allowed to, to not only what you've allowed, but what you've endorsed. God have mercy on the Christian people who don't have enough sense to stay away from the bottle and to say publicly, I'm against it. And so God bless you as we end this year and enter into 2024. Here's your words of encouragement from the pastor, hate liquor, and it won't hurt you a bit to be to abstain, and it won't hurt any of us. You take liquor out of our lives. Um, we might drink a lot more soda pop or water, but to get rid of booze for the glory of God and the hope of our next generation.